Okay, so let's get on to today's stuff. Arrays, chart objects. It always like, just, I don't know, but these semesters just fly by. Do the semesters fly by for students the same way they fly by for professors? Like we're more than halfway done with this semester. Does that seem fast or slow? Who's going slow? <laughs> it's a slow couple of you. I don't know. So today we're talking about chart objects. So go ahead and download. In fact, if you followed along where we were on our last census example, you remember when we had all that data and we made it so we could compare counties against each other easily? We're gonna pick up where we left off on that example. And we're just gonna add charting capabilities to it. So here's what I called census fall of 23. So it looks like right now we're comparing four counties in Virginia. And this, was a, this is a dramatic improvement over how we used to have to look at this data. Like the data set itself was just terrible for, for comparing. But we've got this compare sheet and you know, now we can you know, choose another county to put in here and it brings it in, that looks great. But now what I'd like to do is I'd like to make it so that it's easy to be able to, to compare these now visually, to be able to build a chart to um, like pick a line here and say, you know what? I would like to see these numbers charted against each other so I can look at them and understand. And so we'll do that with VBA. Are we ready to do it? Is there anyone saying, please just give me a few more seconds before we're ready to go. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by recording ourselves creating a chart. So this is how we start at the very beginning of the semester and then we've kind of come through a long segment of where we're just writing code from scratch. But anytime you're saying, wow, I need to do something in VBA that I know how to do in Excel, I don't know how to do it in VBA, like the first thing that should come to your mind is I'll record myself doing it and see what happens. Uh, and that works pretty well. Um, sometimes when, there are some things that the, that the macro recorder just doesn't record. Remember there was one thing, I'll just record that. And it like didn't record anything. That was in the kind of the early days of the macro recorder. Uh, but now the macro recorder records almost everything. Um, it doesn't necessarily record code that is immediately usable, um, but at least it's gonna give you some, some starting point to work with. So if I was gonna make this chart, I think here's how I'd like to do it. I would probably select the data that I'm interested in and then a control click to select my counties and state information. I think having that selected will give me a pretty good uh, default chart. So I'll go ahead and have that selected. I'm just gonna insert a column chart. So column chart is gonna be on this first little drop down here. And I'll just do the simple clustered column chart, even though I don't have clusters, it's just gonna be a single column chart. And that actually looks like a decent way to compare that set of numbers. Oh, I like it. Ultimately, I'm probably going to want to put the chart title on. Well, probably for the, title, for the title, I'll probably just put whatever it is that I'm comparing, you know, so resident total population estimate, whatever. I'll just put that as the title. And then I'll want to kind of put this over here so it's not covering my data. And make it so the next one that comes in goes down below it so they're not going on top of each other and so forth. So yeah, I think we're gonna be pretty good. So now that I see that's the chart I'm after, I'm gonna go ahead and delete it. And now I'm ready to record myself making that selection. So I'll leave my data selected, come to my developer tab, record macro. Um, I guess I'm gonna call it add chart. Add chart. And I guess I'll put a capital C in, which will give it control shift C. I'll store it in this workbook. That looks great. Um, build a comment, build a chart. From the active line, from the active, yeah, from the row with the active cell. But the idea is the user is gonna select a row, they'll press control shift C and it should pop up a chart uh, with that information. Okay. Hmm. Looks good. We'll say okay. Insert column chart. 3D clustered column. I'm sorry, 2D clustered column chart. And I think I am going to go ahead and move it just so I see what it takes to move the chart. 
Well, I'm not sure that's going to give us very good code. And then I'll stop recording. Let's take a look at the code that we just recorded. So Alt F11. And, hmm. Oh, module two. I must have recorded something when we were working before on this. So I think module three is the one we're after. Yeah, here's add chart. Okay. And this code, this code is not that great looking. We're going to clean it up a little bit here. The first thing to realize is that, and this is the first thing that can be really confusing when you're working with charts, is that when you're working with a chart, there's actually two different objects that you're working with that are like one holds the information that's actually to be displayed by the chart, and one holds the information about where that chart is going to be, the size of the chart, where it's positioned, like the top and the left, and so forth. And so let's just take a look at this first line, active sheet. So on, you know, great, identify whatever sheet we're on. And then it's referring to the shapes collection. It's the collection of all the shapes on the sheet. What's a shape on a sheet? Like if you put a button on the sheet, we've done that in class, that is a shape on the sheet. You could put a square. I think even if you put a picture, like, like you can put a picture onto the worksheet, that's in the shapes collection as well. So the interesting thing here is that when we are calling the add chart method, or in this case, the add chart to method, we are, that's actually a method of the shapes collection. And so, um, that's kind of the first thing to point out. It's going to become significant here in just a minute, but let's take a look at what it says. It says, all right, add chart two. Apparently this is just different than add chart. There used to be one called add chart. It's probably still around. I don't know what's different about it, but this is the one that I recorded. I liked the way it worked. I'm going to use this one. Uh, it says 201. I wonder what 201 even means. We get some help on this thing. No help. I don't know what 201 means, but it looks like it looks great. And clustered column chart. I guess that's telling us what kind of chart it's going to make. Now, tell me what's going on with this right here, this dot select afterwards. Someone say something about that method. Like what's going on that we can add a chart and then call dot select after it. You could just tell me what that does. And then I'm really hoping to find kind of underlying why it does it. So go ahead and give me the what and tackle the why if you're interested. That is exactly what it's saying. It's saying, hey, after we create the chart, then make that the active chart. And you'll notice that that's important because later we're going to identify that chart by saying the active chart. But how, oh, how can it actually say select? Does it even, how does it make sense to call a method and then say dot select after the method? This, this, is, not, this is not a direct reference to an object. This is a reference to a method. This is calling a method that says add a chart. So how can I say dot select after it? A little bit louder. Say it again. That was that was that was that was right on. That's right. It creates the chart and then it sends back a reference to the object. So it is identifying an object the same way that when you say something like range A1, if I could spell R-A-N-G-E. A1. This identifies an object. This, what, 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 like when you, when you call that, it says, oh, I'm going to go find that object and I'm going to give you the reference to that object. It sends back the reference to that object. This ad chart's doing the same thing, except it creates the object and then it sends back a reference to it. And so I can call any method or refer to any property of that object right here. It's a really common thing when you create a new object in VBA that it not only creates it, but gives you the it returns. <laughs> It returns the location in memory where it is so that you can call other methods of it. But instead of selecting it, there's no real reason for us to select it. What I would like to do is I would like to capture that reference. I want to remember that reference. Where, where is that chart object in memory? I want to hold on to that. And to do that, I'm going to create an object variable. So before this, I'm going to say dim. Hmm. SHP as, and I can say object here, 
but I would like to kind of get help with IntelliSense. I'm going to tell you what kind of object it is, and that's a shape object. Now, is there such thing as a chart object in, in VBA? Yes. But you're going to notice that, and this is, this is part of the thing that's confusing when you're first diving into charts uh, on your own. Like if you didn't have my expert tutelage to get you through this, this would be the confusing part. The add chart method does not return off, does not return a reference to a chart. It returns a reference to the shape that contains the chart. Does it create a chart object? Yes. It then puts it in a shape object and returns the shape object that it's in. And there's some intuition here because you'll notice that add chart is a method of the shapes collection. So the shapes collection is saying, oh, we're going to add a new one into our collection. What are we going to add? Is it going to be a button? No. Is it just going to be a rectangle? No. Is it going to be a line? No. What's it going to be? It's going to be a chart. So it's going to be a shape that holds a chart, but it returns a reference to a shape. And so I am going to say, create this object here, this variable here. And instead of selecting it, I am going to just catch that set SHP equal to that. So it'll still create the chart, but now it's not going to activate it and I will have a reference to it. So now when it says active chart, is there going to be an active chart now? No, because there's no chart object. There's no shape that holds a chart object selected. And so to get to that, I'm just going to say SHP dot chart. So that shape has a chart property. Every, sh every shape has a chart property. If there's a chart in the shape, then that chart property is referring to the location in memory where the chart is. It's got a reference to that chart in memory. And so, in fact, oh, I love this line. This is great. So here we have chart, set source data, and then we're telling the range that we're going to have. Here's this discontiguous range. And then it's like, oh, you know what? This line is too long to fit on one line. So we're going to add a space and an underscore so we can put the closing brace on the next, the closing parenthesis on the next line. That's delightful. Let me go ahead and bring that back up here under one line. And then, oh, dot chart, active chart, so let's rotate it. Now this is like active sheet shapes chart two. That now is getting to the chart that's in the shape. And so I can replace that with shp.chart. Active sheet shapes chart to shp.chart. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really care for the way that it's done this because it's saying we're changing the position. We're incrementing the left. We're incrementing the top. So we're taking the top, whatever the top was, and we're going to subtract that off of it. I think I'd rather actually set the top of those. So we're going to play with those here in just a second. Ah. But we're going to have to deal with this. And in fact, for this chart to get built correctly, it's actually going to want that data selected first. So let's go ahead and, and start this by adding some code to figure out what should we select. So, hmm, let me dim row as a long integer. We'll keep track of the row that has our data. Hmm. And I think we're also going to need to know the last column as an integer. Because my data, my data are always going to start in column B, but depending on how many counties I'm trying to compare, I'll need to figure out which count, which column is my last column here. All right, so let's, so we've got our row and our last column. Let's go, the row is going to be easy. So row, how do we tell which row we want? How do we want the user to indicate the row they want to chart? Yeah, just select that row. It's like any cell on that row. So I'm just going to set row equal to active cell dot row. So that's the row that has the data that we're going to want to chart. Hmm. But finding the last column, how should we do it? We could, I think we would be safe 
starting on B1 and doing an XL to right, like do and XL to right to cover the data. The only condition that that would be a problem for is if they only have one item. If they only have one and I do like control right, doesn't it takes me like to the end. But if you only have one selected, why are you charting it anyway? What do you hope to get from a chart where you're only charting a single number? So I think we would probably be okay just doing that. But if I'm, if I'm sure there's not gonna be any data after this, then maybe a better way is to start at the end and then come back to the left. That will still work with just one column. Again, not useful charts, but at least it won't break. So I think let's go ahead and take that approach. So in this case, I'm gonna say last call equals cells. So whatever sheet I'm on, that cells. Um, and then in parentheses, which row do I want? Row number one. Which column do I want? Hmm. Which column do I want? I want the very last column. Well, how can I ask for the very last column? Columns.count. I guess there are 16,384 columns, but I can just ask that right here. The truth is, you know, I could put like a big number, like a thousand. Is it I'm gonna to try to chart more than a thousand counties? Or better yet, I could chart 4,000. There aren't 4,000 counties. You wanna chart them all? Great, we could fit in that. But this is just kind of a technique that says, go all the way to the end of the worksheet. And that's referring to that last cell on that first row. And now I should be able to say end XL to left. And that will get me back to the one that has the data on it. Now I'm just after the column of that. And so that should, I should be able to like print that in my immediate window. There's no variable in that that's going to need to be run. So that tells me column two is it. Um, yeah, that's right. Let me go ahead and add another. Yes, we've moved on to Idaho now. Now it should be column four. That should return column four. Yeah. Okay. So now running up to this point, I've got my row and my column. So now I think I'm ready to select a range. Let me go ahead and maybe declare another variable called RNG as a range. And I'm just gonna kind of build up this range. We could do this, we could actually accomplish this without having to have a variable for the range. I think this will make the code a little bit clearer. Set RNG equal to cells. I'm sorry, I'm going to do a multi cell range. So range. And then I'm going to give it two cells a starting cell and an ending cell. So my starting cell is going to be on whatever row my row is and column two, my data starts in column two. And it's gonna end in row, that same row and in my last column. Yeah, I didn't really need to put these into variables because I could have just, instead of row, I could have put this whole expression down here and instead of last call, that whole expression, but that's a long, ugly line to have to deal with. Um, yeah, I probably, if I was writing it myself, I probably would have left it a long, ugly line, but I think it's going to make it more readable for us. And let me just, I'm going to stop right here. And I'll go ahead and run this and it should, let's see, what row am I on? I'm on row 11. If I run this. Oh, this is actually sh not shape chart. This is just shape that increment left because the shape is what actually ha holds the information about the position. Okay. Oh, and I, that's referring to it. So now row should, range should be set. I should be able to come here and look at range. But what I really wanna do is I wanna select it. So after I've defined it, I'll just say RNG dot select. Okay. 
And let's see. Yeah, so that has selected that part of the range first. But I also want to add on this range. I have a multi-cell discontiguous range. And there's kind of a neat thing to do for that. So now what I'm going to do is before I select it, let me go ahead and stop my code. Before I select it, I'm going to say set range equal to union, U-N-I-O-N. -N. So union says you got one range and you want to union that with another range. Like I want to do a discontiguous range. Great. My first range is already defined, R-N-G. And now I'm going to union it with something similar to the statement that I have here. So here's the second range I'm bringing into that union. But instead of being on row number row, it's going to start on row number one. It's going to go to row number two. And it's going to start in column two and go to my last column. That should pull in this range. Starts on row one, ends on row two. Always starts on column two, ends on whatever my last column is. And so now we're first setting the range just to the data that's on the active cell, on the row with the active cell. And then we're going to union to that one. We're going to set it to a new value. What's it going to be? The old value unioned with that new one. That should give us that discontiguous range. So I'm going to select row five this time and run my code. And now I've got that discontiguous range selected. So union, like for selecting discontiguous ranges that you don't know the size of beforehand, boy, being able to union can really be handy. Do I need to do this twice? Could I have said, you know what, let's just take this part right here and put that in for range? Yes, totally could have. But again, that's an ugly line. It's ugly enough as it is. All right, so now I think I would just want to step through this and see what happens. So let me just kind of move this off to the right. And I'm going to step. So F8. I want to see what it does now. Now that data is selected, we're going to add that, that chart. Yeah, that's great. Look. It's actually already figured out all the data that I want. Like just based on what I had selected, it's built the data correctly, which means this other line that looked pretty daunting to me of where we're going to have to kind of build up like the string to set the data. I don't have to do that. Like it's done that already. And so this line is not necessary. I'm going to get rid of it. Hmm. And now this increment, the increment's tough. And it's unfortunate that it records this way because this is moving it a certain way, a certain distance away from where it currently is. Well, where does it create the chart? Like when it creates it, where does it create it? A little louder? Oh no, it doesn't. It happened to do it there, but that's not what, that's not what determines it. How does it know? Like where does it make the chart when this code runs? Here, let's go ahead and I'm going to stop the code and put my active cell like on. Whoa, oh, I think I must be in. I'm in scroll lock or something. Um, shoot. Control, tap my control key. <laughs> control home. Okay, it's like. I have a function on this. I'm not quite sure why when I click it's anchoring. Does anyone know what's going on here in Excel at the moment? I thought this is what happens when you have the scroll lock turned on, but I'm not able to turn it off here. I don't see myself. Oh, I'm in extend selection. See where it says extend selection down here? Oh, it's like F8. Turn it off. Oh, thank goodness. Apparently, F8 is extend select. I never knew that. Typed F8, and now I'm in extend selection mode. Yikes. Okay. Whew. I'm out of extend selection mode. What was I going to do? Oh, I'm going to select a different row here. And let me just like scroll over, like I'm gonna select on that row, and I'm going to scroll way over here and run my code. 
uh, run the code up to the stop. Oh. Oh, you know what? It didn't generate it where I thought it was going to generate it. Oh, it's because it hasn't generated it yet. Okay, so I'm scrolled way off to the side. And let's step through to do that F8. Yeah, okay, so now looking at where it generated it, where did it generate it? I mean, what's determining where, it, where the chart gets built? When it generates that chart, it's gonna be somewhere in the viewport. So depending on how much of the worksheet I'm showing at, at a time, that's gonna change where it gets created. And so I really don't want this to move because it doesn't create it in the same place every time, then I'm sunk if I try to move it a relative movement every time. So it's just unfortunate that it recorded that way. So let me stop this. And instead of doing increment left, I just want to set the left property of it. And where do I want to set it? Like, talk to me in English where, where I want this chart to go. Where do I really want this chart to go? Go ahead. Column, column which one? Oh, oh yeah, you're saying put it right up here. You're gonna make a chart and maybe you're gonna make three or four charts. Let's put the top one here and then we'll put the next one below it. Yeah, well, it turns out you can ask, a, you can, if I just put a fixed unit here, that'll work as long as someone doesn't change how wide the columns are. And if someone doesn't change how many columns we're showing. So column E is, is column number what? That's column number five. And I have calculated that my last column is number four. So I can take my last column plus one. And if I could only ask what that cell, where that cell is, well, it turns out we can. Cells row one, column five, not left. I, I, I can ask where that is. It's at 582. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the left equal to cells, row number one, column number last call plus one. It doesn't have, a, it has a left property and the cell has a width property. So I can ask how wide it is and where the left is, but I can't ask where the right is. So I think simpler is ask where the left of the next cell over is. So my last column plus one will be the next, will be the first empty cell, and I want the left of it. And that's going to put it right at the border, and I think it's going to look a little crowded there. So let's do this. Let's make another, we'll make a constant called margin, and we'll just add on the margin. So I haven't made that yet, but let's go build a constant called margin. We haven't made constants very often. So instead of dim, I'm going to say const margin, and I'll give it its value right here. Const margin equals 10. 10 might be too big. Maybe I'll come back and change it. I don't even know what units that is, but it's some unit. And so now when I'm setting the left of this, then I'm setting it to the left boundary of that first blank column plus a little bit more. And let's just go ahead and set the top equal to the margin. All right. Lovely. I think I'm gonna take, get rid of the stop here and see what it does. Control shift C. Giving me a chart and put it where I want it to go. Or Cassia County, what is that? Oh, population change. They lost people, they lost 68 people. Everyone's moving to Canyon County. All right, let's go ahead and get the title of the chart in here now. All right, so what do you think? Is the title gonna be a property of the shape or will it be a property of the chart that's in the shape? probably of a chart. So let's go ahead and, and see what we can find here. Moving it there. I think 
I think I'm gonna to wanna, to, even before I, um, before I position that, I'm gonna to wanna to put the title in right here. So SHP dot chart dot, all right. What do you think the title is gonna be called? If you're guessing how to, I mean, you're just trying to figure out what the title of the chart is. What do you think the property is gonna be called? If you're gonna guess, maybe title. It's a reasonable thing. Let's take a look. Q-R-S-T. There's only one that starts with T and it's called tab. Whatever that is, so it's not title. Darn it, not title. Name, okay. Try name. There's a name. All right, so what is, I like it. So let's try name. And instead of uh, changing it here, let's just, let's just print and see what it is because it's got a title and it's right now saying chart title. So if this prints out, if this prints out the chart, if it prints out that thing that says chart title, we'll feel pretty good about it. Debug dot, whoops, debug dot print. Chart name. Clear off my immediate window. Run the code. Nope, the name is compare chart six. And in fact, when that's selected, if I come up here to my chart design or maybe my format, somewhere you can set the name here somewhere. I thought you could access it. I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you don't see the name. Where is it? Oh, it's, it's right here. Chart six. Compare. No, that's not the name either because this thing is called compare chart six is the name. So I'm not even sure what, what, that, what that part is, chart six. Anyway, somehow is, oh, so it's just a sheet name plus that chart name is, I don't know what it is. Anyway, it's not the title. We're after the title. That's not it. Oh boy. If it was like, I mean, if you were learning this stuff in the olden days, like when I was doing it, 1995, before like internet was like generally available, what did you have to do? Yeah, it was like you had to read the whole list. Now, it turns out I didn't learn about charts in VBA until after the internet, but I was like determined not to Google this. It was like, I can figure this out. And I did end up just reading through it. Fortunately, the title that I, the, the property that I want is alphabetically kind of high. Has anyone found it yet? What is it? It's called chart title. So chart dot chart title. And I thought, great. I'm just gonna set that equal to what I want it to be. And that won't work because it turns out chart title is an object that has properties. So I hit dot there. Now I can get to caption. Because you know, there's other things. The title has a font and it has um, you know, color and so forth. Now I should be able to set that equal to something. What should it be? Cells, row number, row, column number one. That's where the name is. And I want the value of that. Lovely. I think I'll just go ahead and run that code again, F5. Oh, and I'm debug printing that. So that's telling me, hey, that's, that doesn't, that's not a true statement, right? The, the, the caption does not equal to what's there. I wanna make that into an assignment, run it again. And that is not what I expected. 579, row, number row, column number one. I better stop right there and find out what's going on. Anyone see, anyone see my mistake? I don't see it yet. Okay, so presumably if I ask for this, it's gonna give me 579. Let's ask for the address. Oh, it's A1. I guess my active cell is way up here. Oh. That makes sense. I must have had my active cell here. And so it's picking up the ID 579, which is county number 579 is this one here. All right, so maybe we should do a little checking here that if you're not at least on row three, we've got a problem. So the very first thing after we set row, 
let's just say if rho is less than three, then rho equals three. So in the situation where I'm up there in the header, if I say chart, it's gonna chart the first item. So I'll run it, control shift C. And I think I'm ready to get rid of my stop and just run it through. There we go. So this is a great one to chart the ANSI code for the, um, <laughs> we probably should do number four instead of three, but anyway, there it is. At least it's given me a name uh, for the chart. Now, unfortunately, I've created so many charts here that it's gonna be a pain to delete them all. And I think we're gonna to want to have functionality that deletes off all of the charts. So why don't we write, why don't we pause on our chart creating endeavors? I'm so used to looking at that minute hand up there and I thought, wow, we've got five minutes. Did I ever tell you that story? I don't think I did. The very first semester that I was teaching here, I taught over in the JKB. And the JKB, most of the classes uh, are 50 minute classes. And they actually ring bells. Like I was so surprised to find out that we're still like ringing bells to let folks know when class is over uh, at, in college. Um, but I taught two classes there. One got out when the bell rang. And when and the other one, when the bell rang, class was about halfway over. And like the class that was in the one that was halfway over when the bell rang, like that class realized that every time that bell rang during class, I had a moment of confusion as if I wondered if the class was over. And they conspired to convince me that class was over. And so one day when the bell rang in the middle of class, they packed up and left. They were mostly gone before I realized class was only halfway over. And, I, and at first I was like, that is so rude. And then I went, then again, class is over. <laughs> it's okay with me too. <laughs> okay. So um, like, are all the clocks in the Tanner building wrong at the moment? Does anyone know? That's really wrong. Is the sec, what's that? I'd be very surprised if there's a battery involved in that clock. All right. So, all right, we're gonna go ahead and make a, we're gonna make a, a function to delete off all the charts. All right, so I'm gonna come down here and we're gonna make a sub procedure called clear chart. Clear charts. All right, and I think what I want for this one is a for each loop. I wanna go through all the shapes. And if, it's, and if it's a shape that has a chart in it, I wanna delete it. I think this will work okay, let's find out. So let me dim CHRT as a chart, or no, as a shape, let's call it shape, SHP as a shape. For each shape in active sheet dot shapes. N-E-X-T. And for now, let's just do a debug.print of that shape's name. If I run that, it should just print me off the names of all the shapes. As a shape. For each, uh, for each SHP, there we go. Oh boy, I've got a drop down, I've got a button, and then I've got a bunch of charts. So let's do shape and let's then also do shp.hasChart. So there's a hash chart property that lets me know if, uh, <clears throat> if a shape has a chart in it. And so my drop down one says zero, false. Button three says false. And then all the chart ones are giving me something other than zero, negative one, which is true. So I should just be able to say if shp has chart, then shp delete. So if there is a shape, then delete it. And I think that should delete off only my charts and leave the rest of them there. I'm going to run it. And yeah, left the button, left the drop down, got rid of all of the charts. 
So now I can conveniently clear off my charts. Hmm. I think I'm going to assign that to a hotkey as well, just so I can kind of work on it over here. So I'm going to come to my developer tab, my list of macros, clear charts. Hmm, maybe I should call it delete charts because I'm going to get it, put a hotkey of control shift D for deleting charts. So control shift C will make the chart. Control shift D should delete off all of my charts. Got a bunch of charts. Oops. Control shift D clears them off. Lovely. Okay. I think I think the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to like generate multiple charts here. And so let's do this. Let's say after we've set that chart, the very last thing here, let's just move down a row. Active cell dot offset one row, no columns dot select. So I'm saying, hey, whatever the active cell is, refer to the cell that's one cell below it, and then select it. So if I'm here and I press Control Shift C, I'm getting now different charts each time I generate because I'm moving down through which one I'm interested in making. And Control Shift D will clear those off. So I think now I just got to get this thing positioning correctly. And I've got 25 minutes or so to do it. I think we can do it. Okay, so here's where we're doing the position. These two right here is where we're doing the position. So how can we decide where to put that second chart? The first chart is going there fine. It's going to a great place. Where are we going to put the second chart? I'm thinking right below it. You either go right below it, or we could push all the existing charts down and put it right at the top. I think I like putting it below because I think what I'd also like to do if we have time, I'd like to figure out how to say, you know what, once we've gone down part way, let's go over to the next column and put them down. So maybe we'll say we only want to go five charts tall. And once we've gotten the fifth chart, we want to move over. So let's go ahead and try to put it below where we're going to do it. So any thoughts? What should we do? How could we know if we're putting on something after the first chart? Go ahead. Yeah, so absolutely. We can totally ask how, how tall the chart is and we can put it right below it. But we have to know that there is a prior chart to work with. And it turns out that you know, even though when we're deleting charts, we said, you know what, we can loop through and just see which ones have charts. There's actually, let me go ahead and add two charts on here. It turns out there's another object collection that is just the shapes that have the charts in them. And that one is, Active sheet dot called chart objects. It's a collection of the shapes that have the charts in them. So that tells me there's two. I mean, if I'm just asking, you know, how many shapes there are, there's four because I've got the drop down and I've got the button. Those are both shapes. But there's only two that have these charts. And so by the time I get to here in my code, how many chart objects are there going to be if I'm building the first chart? So if I'm building the very first chart, how many chart objects are there at this point? So what number will that print if these things are all cleared? Control Shift D. What's it going to print? Anyone want to take a guess? Okay, might might print zero. Other guesses? Someone's saying one. Let's run it and see what it does, and then we'll see why. So we run it. 
and it's printing one. Why is it printing one? We're adding one before we get to that line. So there's no charts to start, but by the time we get to, to right there where we're starting to position, there's gonna be one. So I'm gonna say this, if active sheet dot chart ops dot count is equal to one, then we do it this way. Else we do something else. So if there's just one, we've, we're already positioning up the first one, the, that first one, right. Otherwise, what are we gonna do? Hmm. Well, the left is gonna happen the same either way. I'm gonna leave it copied for now because we've got one more thing to do with complexity. I'm not quite, I don't like to move them. I'd like to move them over as well. So let's leave them here for now. We may simplify that code. But the top is not gonna be the top. What's it gonna be? It's gonna be the margin plus the top of my last, of my most recently added chart. Oops, plus. So I should be able to say active sheet. In fact, I probably, let me go ahead and write in here. Let me just make an object called most recent chart. Dim MRC, most recent chart as a chart object. So I've got a variable called M MRC. It's a chart object variable. And here, if I know there is, uh, well, it's always gonna be a chart object because we're creating one. I'm just gonna set MRC, most recent chart, equal to chart objects, sorry, active sheet, not chart objects. And then I'll identify it by number. What's the number? Count of those chart objects. So if there are two, then the number two will be the most recently added one. So now I should say my top is gonna to be my margin plus my most recent chart dot top plus my most recent chart dot height. So when I'm putting the second or the third one, it should say, we'll find the last chart and we're gonna add onto its top, its height, which will get us to the bottom of the chart and then add on the margin as well. And that should be the top that we're setting for this new chart. Question? Nope. Ooh. Control shift D to clear them all off. Control shift C. It's on the first one. Hmm. Next one went further down than I thought it should. Let's go see what I did wrong. Like it doesn't need the height, but it should. So the shape I just created, most recent charts top. Let me go ahead and stop the code here and just poke around. Control shift C puts the first one. That hits stop right here. So let me, oops, let me run to my most recent chart. So it looks like it's a, it is a chart object. Top of that most recent chart is 175. I don't think it is. Oh, oh, the most recent chart is the one that just got added. That's the problem. Which one do I want? I want the penultimate chart. I want the one before the last one. So Alt F11, stop my code. So most recent chart, I think I'm still gonna leave it most recent chart because I'm thinking about the one that was there, not the one I'm adding, the last one there. So instead of the count, I'm gonna do the count minus one. And that should give me the right one. So when I'm setting the most recent chart equal to the chart objects, 
The most recent added one is the one I'm adding right now. That's not the one I mean. I want the one before that. So I'm subtracting one off of it. All right, let's try that. Control shift D, control shift C, C. So yeah, now it's putting them in nicely. Ooh, that's pretty good. Let's go back to the code. Yikes. Okay, questions. Show me how comfortable you are with the stuff that we've covered today. Kind of a lot of ground. Five, 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 four. This looks pretty good. Okay. Now, the last thing that I want to do in our example today is after we get to a certain number high, I'd like to move over and then put them over here. So, oof, how could we tell if we've reached that point? Let's say it's five, four or five. How could we tell if we've kind of just crossed the boundary into, we don't want to keep going down, we want to go over and back to the top. Go ahead. That's right, if I just say, hey, is it more than five? Let's move over, that works for the kind of the first column, then I've got the same problem when I get to the end of the second column. So I think what I wanna do is I wanna identify just when I when that column has just gotten just past its limit. And in that case, move over and go back to the top. And I think mod is gonna be the one that helps us here. Is that what? Hold on. Hey, mod. Yeah, so if I take my number of charts, mod five or so, and if that equals one, then this is the, should be the first chart in the column. All right. And we've got the strange situation of it being like the first one, but like even when it's the very first one created, I think I'm gonna do it before I get to this if, and then we'll think through what we have to do in that if state. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say if active sheet chart objects dot count mod five, mod, let's do mod four equals one then. We should hit that the first time through. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and clear, Control Shift C, you know, Control Shift D, and then Control Shift C. Okay, good, so we're hitting that here. Okay, so in this case, every time we're in this situation, I think our top needs to be the margin. We need to make the top equal to the margin at this case. So let's bring our, let's just say the top, and equal the margin. We're going to do that right here. Okay, so that's going to put us at the top there. And how are we going to figure out where the left goes? So I think we want to set the left to be a default. So let's make a default for the left. Let's just declare, come up here and declare a variable called left. And we're gonna default the left to go just after our data. So default left as single. Single precision floating point number. And maybe even before we ask if our chart counts mod four is one, let's just set the left. Like the default left is what we're currently setting for the left all the time.
So it's mod four. So let's just set the left property, the, our left variable, equal to where we're calculating the end of the data, adding the margin. That's going to be the default position. Now, we're going to change that. If we're past, if we're, if we have more than four. Okay. So if we have less, if we have four or less, that's going to be the one. Okay. So here we're, we're setting, I don't need to stop here anymore. We're setting the top that way. Now I think we want to say here is if the number of charts that we have is greater than four, then Hmm. Actually, I think we want it to be. Anyone think of a good algorithm for this? What would be clean? Because I think we always want it to be the same as the one above it, except for when we're moving over. So in this case, we're moving over. So I think we want to do it right here. So if, so this is, hey, we need to move over. We are either first column, just starting or moving over. And no matter what happens when we're in that, one of the, in that case, we're going to set the top equal to the margin. Now, what we're gonna say here is if, yeah, if the number of chart objects we have is one, if it's our very first one, then we want the left to be this, where we're reading off the sheet. then shp.left equals that one that we're reading off the where the data is on the sheet. Otherwise, we need to get it to move over. And so I think we have to do something similar to moving down, but just moving it over. Otherwise, our shapes left is going to be hmm whatever the last one was, let me copy where we're doing the logic for the top. Wherever our most recent one is, okay, SHP left, and equal the margin plus our most recent charts left, plus our most recent charts width. Yeah, I like it. Where are we setting our most recent chart? I'm gonna set the most recent chart. Hmm. Finding where to set the most recent chart is a little bit of a problem. Because if I put it here, if I put it up here, this is gonna fail when we have our very first chart object. So I think I'm just gonna, I think for now, let me just put an error trap around this. So we're gonna to try to set the most recent chart each time. It turns out this is gonna fail the very first time we're creating it. But every other time is when we're going to need it. And we might clean that up a bit in here in just a minute. So that'll give us our most recent chart. That should do this here. OK, so in the case when we're just starting or moving over, I think we're good. The top is always going to be the top of the sheet. The left is either going to be the one we determined 
or it's going to be a chart's width away from you. Now, the only thing we have to do now is set the top and left for every other condition. So here we're adding another chart to a column. And in that case, the left is going to be, or the top is going to be one lower than the last one. And the left is going to be the same as the last one. Most recent chart dot left. Yeah. So that's that's our code. Will it work? I don't know. Let me run it and see. We may need to make some adjustments here. Like we're making charts as much as we please. But one other thing that I would like on this to do on this is that the, the one thing I'm just uncomfortable here is that, see, am I using four in here twice? Is this the only place where I have to change the four? Like if I wanted to have five instead, let me change that to five and just see if it works. Oh yeah, I've only got it in one place. I'm not, oh, well, I guess I'm past my data. So yeah, I don't mind it. I mean, if I want to change the column, I've got to figure out to change that number right there, but that's okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. I think that's a pretty good algorithm. Any questions? The only thing that's a little bit ugly about this is saying, hey, let's try to set the most recent chart if it fails, we're okay for it to fail because the only time it's going to fail is once the first one, and we don't need it for the first one, but we need it for every other one. I wasn't so happy with an error trap there. I could say, I could make that based on if there's more than one chart, do this. Um, but not too bad to have a little exercise to remind us what an error trap looks like. All right. Well, I don't want to be a tease, but I think we're done. So let's go ahead and finish. Um, thanks for coming. Class dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.